The Holy Gospel this morning is the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning with the first verse. The Gospel lesson this morning is continuing the series of teachings from the Last Supper during this Lenten season. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. I am the real vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and that you so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Here ends the gospel for the day. Thanks be to God. Let us be seated, please. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You got to be really observant when one reads this gospel. You have to know, first of all, where Jesus is and what has been happening before this time. You say, Pastor Ted, how can we know that? Well, let me tell you this. This is the 15th chapter of John. The 14th chapter of John goes like this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house of many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. We all know that one from memory. Well, that begins the 14th chapter, and we begin five chapters of what's called in biblical studies the farewell discourse of Jesus. Chapter 15 continues that farewell discourse of Jesus. And what we read as chapter 15 begins are words almost as stunning as the beginning of chapter 14. I am the vine, you are the branches, my father is the vine dresser. The only thing is I left out a word. I left out a terribly important word. All of us understand vines, a few of us have grown grapes. How many here have ever grown grapes? A <laughs> couple of hands are going up. Well, it's kind of fun, but it is a lot of work. And it's work that's time sensitive, and it's skill sensitive, and it's discipline sensitive. It's hard work. My father-in-law, Don, living on a shore of the Finger Lakes, what a way to retire takes me one Sunday afternoon to a hillside, sloping down rather sharply, covered with the most luxurious grapevines I believe I've ever seen. And I'm going, wow! He said, well, get out of the car and go look. And so I walk up the hill a little bit, and in all this luxurious growth, there's not a grape, much less a cluster, to be found. He said, it's an abandoned vineyard. It cannot be restarted. I said, well, somebody can come in and prune it back to the three buds on the branch. And, and he said, yeah, but you don't know which of the producing branches anymore. It can't be done. It can only be dug up and burned. Well, that's part of the issue here, but that's not all the issue. What really is the issue is the word I left out. 
it says, depending on your translation, it says, I read to you, by the way, from the TAV, Ted's Authorized Translation. <laughs> it says, I am the real vine. Now, if Jesus is the real vine, or to read the RSV, the true vine, which means there must be an untrue vine or something that's not real. So I just translate it real. I am the real vine. You don't catch right at the beginning how virtually revolutionary that statement becomes. Because you see, while we like the image of the good shepherd and God as the shepherd of his people, much better known in the Old Testament was the idea of Israel being the vineyard of the Lord. And the vineyard, the vine, was the symbol of the nation of Israel. So much was it the symbol of the nation of Israel that on the doorpost of the temple to the Holy of Holies, the two posts that braced the doors going into the Holy of Holies, where only the priests could go, there were sparkling, brilliant, those columns were covered with pure gold, and the gold was sculptured grapevines loaded with clusters of grapes, symbolizing Israel as the vineyard of the Lord. And the prophets all talk about it. Isaiah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. Amos talks about it. Hosea talks about it. Ezekiel talks about it. Psalm 80 sings about it. It's all through the Old Testament. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord. Except, Jesus says, you see that over there, those golden things? And, and people live their lives to save up enough money to maybe give a gift of pure gold for a grape on the columns of the Holy of Holies. And Jesus said, you see the vine over there? I and the true vine. That was to an, Israel, an, an Israelite virtually heresy. That Jesus is standing in the place of the vineyard of the Lord and calling himself the vine and calling all of us the branches and likening God as the vine dresser who prunes out the branches that bear no fruit and cuts them back so they do not sap the vine. And then at the same time, he prunes back the fruiting branches. Are you ready for this? They can be, I, I had an arbor in Lancaster and it was just a joy in the summertime to go, walk under it and it would just be hanging totally full of grapes. You couldn't see the sky through it, dense with hanging clusters of grapes. And I also have to mention also bees, but it kept my wife ever from walking under the grape arbor. But at any rate, uh, what you had to do in January and February, which usually is not as warm as it has been this January and February and March, is prune the bearing branches back from these long branches, the bearing branches back to three buds, just three buds. If you let them continue to go, they will become non-productive, and you can never make them productive again just three buds. It took disciplined pruning because you like the luxurious bush, you like, you, you like the green, the beautiful leaves, but to cut it so harshly was necessary or it would not bear a crop. And then the vines would be useless. Now, and of course, what you cut off turned out to be in the, in the late winter, a mound of twigs and branches from the vine, absolutely useless for anything except to be burned. So it was hard work. Now we go back and Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and my father is the vine dresser who goes through and cleans out the useless branches and prunes back and strengthens the fruitful branches. But the only reason the vine exists is to bear fruit 
for the kingdom of God. Now, why does Jesus choose to tell it now? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Because Jesus is soon now going to go out to Gethsemane. He's going to be arrested there. The whole process begins on Thursday evening and Friday morning until he ends up sometime on Friday hanging on a cross. He will not be available as he has been available to the disciples. It will be profoundly important that they understand that it's important that they remain abiding in him, even though he's not there to teach and to nurture and to pressure. He tells us the advocate, the Holy Spirit will do that, but we can never forget that the purpose is to bear fruit for the kingdom. A striking book written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran pastor in Germany during the Nazi regime, who was hanged several days before his concentration camp was liberated, to be specific, on the 9th of April, 1945, by the direct orders of Adolf Hitler. But before he was hanged, in 1939, before he'd gone back to Germany to be with his people during that era of the Nazi regime, he wrote a book entitled The Cost of Discipleship. And he begins by talking about cheap grace. Cheap grace preaching forgiveness without repentance, practicing baptism without discipline, practicing the process of living in Christ without the work of discipleship. And he said, it's cheap grace that has made the church incapable of standing up to the Nazi regime, incapable of being different from its world, incapable of carrying out what's responsible for that. When he was called before the Gestapo for a hearing, something like a trial, instead of apologizing, he said firmly, I am an, an implacable enemy of Adolf Hitler and everything he stands for. But the problem for the church at that time was that it was willing to compromise with the Fuhrer rather than to bear the fruit of repentance and of discipline and of faithfulness. By the direct orders of Hitler, he was hung just before the camp was liberated, lest he ever be free. You and I are called as the church not just to be busy. We're called not just to grow leaves and to make things happen. We're called to be under the discipline of Jesus Christ and to reflect in our lives the same grace and love and forgiveness to others that we experience in Christ's love and forgiveness for us. They are to see Christ in us. The late bishop of the New York Synod, William Lazarus, once said, you know, give me your checkbook. I'll show you your God. Another time, he said, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Where would anybody see any difference between who you are and what the rest of the world is? We're called not just to be luxurious. We're called not just to be busy, but we're called to be disciplined, disciples for Christ to be fruitful. And if not, to be cut out of the vine. Whether we belong to the organization or not. We talk as Lutherans about the grace of God, that you can't do anything to earn it. And that's absolutely correct. But at the same time, we are called as Lutherans not to take the grace of God in vain. Even St. Paul says, if God is so anxious to forgive, let us, let us sin all the more so that God can be more of God's self. Even Paul realizes the temptation of that and similarly rejects it. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.